Jeff Dunn is coming today to join us on Cancer Stories. And Jeff's here to talk about something I'm really passionate about, which is the power of volunteering and what volunteers can bring to cancer patients in general. Jeff, you run the uh, Queensland Cancer Council in Australia? Yes, that's correct. The Cancer Council Queensland, which is a long-standing community-based cancer control organisation. And by community-based, uh, just to reinforce that there is a, a relatively small staff who, who raise money and organise the uh, affairs of the Cancer Council, but, but who are supported by you know, a large group, thousands actually, yeah. of uh, regular volunteers on a daily basis. So if we compare like different organisations, I mean, there's probably endless across the world, but obviously you'll be familiar with the ones in Australia. How do you kind of rank in terms of size? Uh, well, I think in terms of, you know, global cancer charities, uh, Cancer Council Queensland is often considered to be, you know, one of a group of well-developed uh, and globally contributing organisations. So we certainly are involved through the uh, Union for International Cancer Control in, in supporting the development of other cancer councils around the world as well. But really, the critical thing is how much benefit do you bring to the patients and family members, isn't it? Mm. And that's sometimes hard to measure, but how would you reflect on how your organisation brings benefit to cancer patients? Sure, and that's, uh, I mean, that's what is at the heart of our organisation. And, you know, we started out uh, 50 years ago, or 53 years ago now, uh, where we identified some gaps and have grown over the years specifically to try and fill those. And uh, you know, priorities for us are supportive care, you know, quality of life for people diagnosed with cancer and their families and friends. And we have developed over the years a suite or a, a range of uh, layered approaches to provide opportunities for people when diagnosed with cancer to enter our system and then to be offered a range of programs and services and opportunities which we believe and which evidence tells us uh, will make a positive difference in their lives. Now, do some of those interventions, some of those um, things that you offer, are, are they suggested by the patients and families themselves or do you, do you come up with them, trial them and say, okay, we'll, we'll stick with this? I mean, how do you decide what the population with cancer actually needs? Mm. And once again, a good question. So uh, we're guided by a few things in our program development. Uh, first of all, evidence. Mm. You know, we, we look around the world and see what other organisations are doing and see what things are working and so we keep a close eye on the literature, the academic and, uh, and program literature. Uh, but uh, we are, as I said earlier, a community-based organisation and we keep close to the community. We have um, a multitudinous array of points of contact uh, through volunteers, uh, through public lectures, through community gatherings, uh, through our events uh, for uh, members of the community to feed back into us. And, and it's, I suppose, that combination of being in touch with, um, in touch with community needs as it changes and evolves, and balancing that with what we know are evidence-based approaches, where we get the best possible outcomes for patients. Mm. So, what particular things are you particularly proud of, and what things do you notice the patients really benefit from? Well, I, I think for us, you know, Queensland is a, a big state. I'm not sure if uh, everyone's familiar with the geography, but. Uh, Queensland is uh, the second largest state by area in Australia. Uh, it uh, has a population of four and a half million people and most of those people are just down the coastline. Mm. So it's a big place uh, with a big geography. Mm. So for us, one of our challenges has been to try and make sure that all Queenslanders, wh wherever they live, uh, certainly those in the capital city, but, but those as well 2,000 kilometres away in the, in the northwest, uh, can... Uh, can access services. So certainly remote services, we're looking at uh, provision through, um, uh, through tele-based services, through new technologies, through making sure that we regionalise our activities. Uh, it's been a priority for us. And that's where volunteers mm. uh, play a particularly important role for us because we, we can never employ enough staff mm. uh, to post or to get around all of Queensland on a regular basis. But by mobilising that community energy and that goodwill, uh, out through uh, Queensland towns, cities and uh, centres, uh, we, we can start to make sure that we do have a presence uh, throughout the whole of the state. And would the Cancer Council be the first port of call typically for a patient in the community 
who was reaching out for help and you know wondering what what could they uh, access well that's that's what we're working for <laughs> yeah. uh, we we're, we're hoping that every person who's diagnosed with cancer uh, calls our helpline okay. uh, and that's our target and you know we get tens of thousands of calls every year but uh, we would like to make a call to the Cancer Council standard care for anyone who's diagnosed with the disease. Mm. So let's talk about volunteering and what volunteers bring to um, help in regards to cancer patients. A particular type of volunteer that we're keen to access are volunteers who've had experience of cancer themselves, mm. either directly or in their family. Is that something that you value? Is that something that you prioritise? or? You know, what, what's your idea of the kind of people that would come forward? Sure. Um, a peer support uh, yeah. is, is critical to our service profile and has always been. And in fact, you know, over the past 30 years, a peer support uh, has been a central focus. Uh, and before we had psychologists and all these other types of things we now have on staff, uh, much of what we did was built around peer support. And uh, I mean, to be frank, you know, the the foundation, the, the underlying principle of peer support is, is that shared personal experience. And in relation to cancer, it's that where someone who's had cancer detected, uh, diagnosed, treated, uh, managed, mm -hmm. and then through that survivorship stage, uh, someone who's had that experience can be a valuable source of support uh, for someone who's about to undergo that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the, I mean, that's the foundation, shared personal experience. The energy for it, mm. I mean, the real passion for it comes when a, when a person who's had that experience uh, wants to support someone about to go through it, uh, wants to try and, uh, people talk about benefit finding and transformational change, but someone who's had that experience who wants to help someone who's just newly diagnosed mm. or someone who's in that journey at some point in the continuum. Mm. So in a combined way, you know, we believe uh, that peer support provides a unique and, and powerful contribution to that supportive care suite of programs and services. Okay, I, I would agree with that, but some people say to me, would everybody be ready to offer their time, resources to new patients who might be struggling? Could it be sometimes that that's too much of a raw nerve for patients? In your organization, is there, is there always a role that can be found for somebody enthusiastic, or has there got to be some kind of filter system? Oh, look, there's always a role, yeah. uh, and it's, it's like for, for people who want to come and, and support our work, there is always a role, but you're absolutely right. Uh, not everyone who is diagnosed with cancer who wants to come and contribute back, not, not every one of those people might be best suited for a peer support role mm -hmm. in, in that very intimate one-to-one -one relationship with someone who's newly diagnosed, because you know, there are you know, pressures and characteristics and, mm -hmm. and uh, episodes that people need to deal with. Mm -hmm. So not everyone is suited to say, a one-to-one -one peer support role, but there are roles for uh, for people who want to come back, and it, it can be, you know, as much as helping us to raise funds, helping us raise awareness in communities, uh, being public speakers, uh, finding different things that each and every one of those volunteers can do. Okay, focusing on this peer support model where it's actually help, emotional mm. support. Um, how can that best be organised? Not just in your system. I know you've got expertise there, sure. but. In other systems, which may be more hospital-based, mm. you've got community-based, hospital-based. Mm. How do you think peer support can be organised? Because I notice looking around different units, okay, I'm looking at it from a medical perspective, sure. but it's actually rare to find peer support in a hospital system. It's a massive gap, in my opinion, and I, I think we should be doing much more in that. But maybe there's an organisational issue, I don't know. Mm. So imagine an organisation starting off and saying, yeah, we agree with these principles, but what, what do we do? How do you, how would you envisage it getting off the ground? Yeah, I mean, it's an important series of points you raise. Uh, uh, peer support, uh, up front, I think what we do need to recognise is that peer support in and of itself is, is not the answer for everyone. And peer support programmes, where they work best is where they're embedded in a, in a more broadly based suite of activities. And, and I think if, if you were starting up with a peer support programme and presenting it or, or trying to sell it to a to a health system or to a hospital or an agency as a panacea, well, then you would strike problems. And, and, and we would never claim it's the right thing for everyone because there are some people, there are some circumstances, uh, there are some occasions in which uh, peer support is not the right answer. Uh, so an important part of training and developing people who are involved in peer support activities 
is about uh, recognising where they're able to make a contribution and rec recognising perhaps where it might be best to, to refer on or seek advice or, or look for alternative ways to support that person. Mm. Now, c clearly in, in negotiation with health systems, we, we've seen that there's been a, certainly a professionalisation of supportive care and that's a, that's a terrific thing and we're, we're trying to encourage the development of people with skills in psychosocial oncology and psych psychiatric liaison working in cancer units and wards. So if you come up and start talking about a volunteer program, uh, there is, a, I, I think, a, a process to, to work with those professionals and demonstrate from an evidence point of view and from an efficacy point of view and from a maintenance point of view how you can deliver that program. Mm. So you're not going to interfere with the routine service of there. You're not going to compromise compliance with treatment. Mm. You're not going to complicate that person's life, but actually add some value where peer support is an appropriate intervention. Peer support can be delivered in different modalities. For example, Cancer Stories is kind of peer support via video, mm. but you could have peer support over the telephone. You could have peer support via group. That's probably the standard model. Mm. You could have peer support one-to-one. -one. I think you, uh, you know, as an organization have tested quite a few of these models. Mm. Does everything have its place or are certain ones superior or what, what's your thinking about how peer support should be delivered? Well, I mean, peer support is a, is a, I mean, it's a complex dynamic. It's a, it's a naturalistically occurring um, uh, human behavior. We, we, we share things, we talk with, with each other about things. So it, it happens out there all the time. If you, if you talk about a programmatic approach to peer support, you're right. There can be one-to-one -one peer support and there can be dyadic, well, you know, that sort of thing, and then group-based. It can be professionally led, if it's groups, or it can be volunteer-led. It can be in-person, it can be remote. Uh, so it is a complex environment. Our technologies have allowed us uh, a whole new range of opportunities, you know, Skyping and all these types of things which 20 years ago weren't available. I, I think the critical thing about peer support is understanding that each of those modalities uh, provides opportunities, but also challenges. So working with your volunteers, the deliverers, and also working with the patients uh, who you're going to be talking with about what suits them best. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, uh, Skyping works terrific, you know, particularly for people far out. Uh, uh, some people prefer the anonymity of a telephone, and we have found that to be the case as well, rather than face-to-face -face, mm. uh, either, you know, by Skype or uh, in the same room. So I, I think, as with a lot of supportive care uh, activity, if you, you can provide that... Uh, that sort of mix mm. opportunities because patients aren't passive recipients of supportive care. Mm. You know, cancer patients and family and friends will actively seek out those things which best suit their needs and their style. So uh, being able to provide that, that suite of opportunities is the best. Mm, mm, mm. I'm going to ask you now about acceptability because in my view, if you look at different interventions we give locally, where we do have peer support, it tends to be quite highly accepted. But we're looking at a small sample. You've got a massive sample. You mentioned to me earlier, mm. something like 18,000 telephone calls. Mm. You know, mm. This gives you a lot of data to, to mm. comment on whether peer support is accepted by everyone, a proportion, and what are those predictors if there are um, such things. Mm. What's your view about how acceptable peer support is to your callers or to your... Um, Clientele. Sure. I mean, peer support, if you look at the, the literature and the evidence, and I, I, perhaps it's important to point out that peer support is underreported in the literature, just mm. to um, recognise that up front, because I think for the research community over time, uh, they've been more interested in, in developing professional models of care and researching those rather than perhaps things that were seen as more community-based. But, but, but that's slightly changing. Uh, if, if you look at the evidence on peer support, it, it is a fact that for... Uh, it's, it's generally acceptable, in fact, highly acceptable as an intervention. Mm. And for some subgroups, for example, young women with breast cancer is one, it is the preferred method of support. So if you say to that group of women, you think about all of these things, which one would you like as a form of support? Peer support is number one. Uh, so it, it is generally acceptable out there. And, and I think also to wrap up in the discussion about it, what we know about the benefits of peer support, because the evidence is strong in relation to reducing feelings of isolation, mm. normalizing patient experience, yeah. you know, helping with coping strategies. Uh, peer support's been associated with uh, improved compliance with treatment yeah. and also been associated with, with improvements 
in um, in physical symptoms yeah. as a consequence of treatment. Yeah. So there's a range of benefits associated with it, and it's highly acceptable. I think it is a matter then of working on an ongoing basis, uh, promoting it, making it available to patients and their family members and friends who might want to access it, and then providing it by way of evidence, sound programs and evaluation uh, to our professional colleagues and hospitals, units and health services as an alternative and a, and a, and a very worthwhile one, mm. uh, which will improve the quality of life of the people that they're working with. Mm. Mm. You've done some studies recently uh, comparing modalities of peer support, and I wonder whether um, you can comment on where the science is going in terms of the direction of travel. Is peer support something that should be augmented with a healthcare professional? Is that down to local conditions? Is it something that should be sustained over a period of time, or can brief interventions be sufficient? What's your, what's your view on that? Well, it's an interesting one. So, for example, um, there are some peer support groups um, uh, that aren't time limited or, or aren't focused, and, and sometimes if they roll on over time, that they can be uh, less helpful for patients than perhaps the original intention would have suggested. Mm. So there, there is a there is a movement to some sort of time limited goal focus, more of a psychoeducational sort of peer supportive activity. Uh, but but there's I mean there's plenty of room in peer support because it's such a like a broad brush approach to things. What, what we do need to try and do, I think, is understand uh, a couple of things about it. Like, what are the actual drivers? I spoke before about the fundamental principles, which is uh, shared personal experience, and then that, that energy or enthusiasm for people to turn uh, their experience into something positive for themselves and others. And they drive it, but some of the psychological principles about what actually works in peer support, what's a dose? How do you calculate a therapeutic dose of, the, of peer support? These sorts of things are a part of an ongoing body of work, uh, both in Australia, here in the UK and around the world, to try and better understand how it can be delivered. Mm. Because sometimes people with the best of intentions and hearts of gold uh, may not be well designed to deliver a peer supportive intervention. Mm. Uh, and it's about training, mm. it's about selection, uh, it's about all of those things that we'd like to those sort of standards we'd apply for our, say, professional mm. uh, service deliverers, but also for our volunteer ones as well. Mm. Jeff, what's your overall impression of working in this area for quite a while now about the kind of power of peer support? I know personally I've kind of been surprised at the power, the benefit patients get from being in, for example, a group therapy mm. environment. What's, what's your take-home message for the overall power and in a way, how much other units who are perhaps not practicing a peer mm. support model should really think about, you know, we could develop this. What, what's your, what's your take-home message there? Look, there's no question in my mind that, that, you know, those of us that are health professionals, no matter how skilled we are, no matter how long we've been at university, no matter how many cancer patients and family, family members and friends we've spent time with, uh, no matter all that, um, we, we can never know, unless we've had this disease, what it's like to have it. Um, uh, peer support is a unique and, and powerful source of support because uh, people who have lived through that experience, they've learned from it, uh, they've internalized parts of it, and they've decided they want to come out and, and help people going through that same experience or similar experience, uh, they are a unique, uh, potent, and highly valuable source of support, which if we can muster and harness you know, engage them in, in our efforts to improve the quality of life, uh, that can provide something that, that our health professionals, uh, and I'm one of them, and our health systems uh, can't do without. Jeff, thanks for coming in today. I think you've given a fantastic overview of volunteering and particularly peer support. And I think it will be very encouraging, not just for patients and families, but for organisations too, who might spend a little bit more energy looking at how they can develop these models because at the end of the day it's all about how we can benefit patients and you've given us uh, some tremendous angles and insights into how to do that. So thanks very much. Thanks Alex, I appreciate it.